Hey, welcome back, and thanks for joining me. May the Lord bless you through these readings, which are for day number 79 in the Digging Deeper Daily Reading Plan. Numbers 17 and 18, the first reading in Psalm 37, and the second reading in Luke 23. Yesterday, we heard another dramatic chapter in Israel's history, the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They must have been included in those who refused to go to the promised land, but then they had the gall to find fault with Moses that he didn't lead them to that land. It is also incredible that God would prove Moses' authority so dramatically, resulting in the death of three conspirators and their families, yet the people would the next day without fear accuse Moses of killing the Lord's people, resulting in a plague. Numbers 17 Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to bring you twelve wooden staffs, one from each leader of Israel's ancestral tribes, and inscribe each leader's name on his staff. Inscribe Aaron's name on the staff of the tribe of Levi, for there must be one staff for the leader of each ancestral tribe. Place these staffs in the tabernacle in front of the ark, containing the tablets of the covenant, where I meet with you. Buds will sprout on the staff belonging to the man I choose. Then I will finally put an end to the people's murmuring and complaining against you. So Moses gave the instructions to the people of Israel. And each of the twelve tribal leaders, including Aaron, brought Moses a staff. Moses placed the staffs in the Lord's presence in the tabernacle of the covenant. When he went into the tabernacle of the covenant the next day, he found that Aaron's staff, representing the tribe of Levi, had sprouted, budded, blossomed, and produced ripe almonds. When Moses brought all the staffs out of the Lord's presence, he showed them to the people. Each man claimed his own staff, and the Lord said to Moses, Place Aaron's staff permanently before the Ark of the Covenant to serve as a warning to rebels. This should put an end to their complaints against me and prevent any further deaths. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. Then the people of Israel said to Moses, Look, we are doomed, we are dead, we are ruined. Everyone who even comes close to the tabernacle of the Lord dies. Are we all doomed to die? Numbers 18 Then the Lord said to Aaron, You, your sons, and your relatives from the tribe of Levi will be held responsible for any offenses related to the sanctuary. But you and your sons alone will be held responsible for violations connected with the priesthood. Bring your relatives of the tribe of Levi, your ancestral tribe, to assist you and your sons as you perform the sacred duties in front of the tabernacle of the covenant. But as the Levites go about all their assigned duties at the tabernacle, they must be careful not to go near any of the sacred objects or the altar. If they do, both you and they will die. The Levites must join you in fulfilling their responsibilities for the care and maintenance of the tabernacle but no unauthorized person may assist you. You yourselves must perform the sacred duties inside the sanctuary and at the altar. If you follow these instructions, the Lord's anger will never again blaze against the people of Israel. I myself have chosen your fellow Levites from among the Israelites to be your special assistants. They are a gift to you, dedicated to the Lord for service in the tabernacle. But you and your sons, the priests, must personally handle all the priestly rituals associated with the altar and with everything behind the inner curtain. I am giving you the priesthood as your special privilege of service. Any unauthorized person who comes too near the sanctuary will be put to death. The Lord gave these further instructions to Aaron. I myself have put you in charge of all the holy offerings that are brought to me by the people of Israel. 
I have given all these consecrated offerings to you and your sons as your permanent share. You are allotted the portion of the most holy offerings that is not burned on the fire. This portion of all the most holy offerings, including the grain offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings, will be most holy, and it belongs to you and your sons. You must eat it as a most holy offering. All the males may eat it, and you must treat it as most holy. All the sacred offerings and special offerings presented to me when the Israelites lift them up before the altar also belong to you. I have given them to you and to your sons and daughters as your permanent share. Any member of your family who is ceremonially clean may eat of these offerings. I also give you the harvest gifts brought by the people as their offerings to the Lord, the best of the olive oil, new wine, and grain. All the first crops of their land that the people present to the Lord belong to you. Any member of your family who is ceremonially clean may eat this food. Everything in Israel that is specifically set apart for the Lord also belongs to you. The firstborn of every mother, whether human or animal, that is offered to the Lord will be yours. But you must always redeem your firstborn sons and the firstborn of ceremonially unclean animals. Redeem them when they are one month old. The redemption price is five pieces of silver, as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel, which equals twenty geras. However, you may not redeem the firstborn of cattle, sheep, or goats. They are holy and have been set apart for the Lord. Sprinkle their blood on the altar and burn their fat as a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The meat of these animals will be yours, just like the breast and the right thigh that are presented by lifting them up as a special offering before the altar. Yes, I am giving you all these holy offerings that the people of Israel bring to the Lord. They are for you and your sons and daughters to be eaten as your permanent share. This is an eternal and unbreakable covenant between the Lord and you, and it also applies to your descendants. And the Lord said to Aaron, You priests will receive no allotment of land or share of property among the people of Israel. I am your share and your allotment. As for the tribe of Levi, your relatives, I will compensate them for their service in the tabernacle. Instead of an allotment of land, I will give them the tithes from the entire land of Israel. From now on, no Israelites except priests or Levites may approach the tabernacle. If they come too near, they will be judged guilty and will die. Only the Levites may serve at the tabernacle, and they will be held responsible for any offenses against it. This is a permanent law for you to be observed from generation to generation. The Levites will receive no allotment of land among the Israelites, because I have given them the Israelites' tithes, which have been presented as sacred offerings to the Lord. This will be the Levites' share. That is why I said they would receive no allotment of land among the Israelites. The Lord also told Moses, Give these instructions to the Levites. When you receive from the people of Israel the tithes I have assigned as your allotment, give a tenth of the tithes you receive, a tithe of the tithe, to the Lord as a sacred offering. The Lord will consider this offering to be your harvest offering, as though it were the first grain from your own threshing floor or wine from your own wine press. You must present one-tenth of the tithe received from the Israelites as a sacred offering to the Lord. This is the Lord's sacred portion, and you must present it to Aaron the priest. Be sure and give to the Lord the best portions of the gifts given to you. Also give these instructions to the Levites. When you present the best part of your offering, it will be considered as though it came from your own threshing floor or winepress. You, Levites, and your families may eat this food anywhere you wish, for it is your compensation for serving in the tabernacle. You will not be considered guilty for accepting the Lord's tithes 
if you give the best portion to the priests. But be careful not to treat the holy gifts of the people of Israel as though they were common. If you do, you will die. A wonderful psalm for giving us the right perspective in our fallen world. The first part of Psalm 37, a psalm of David. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn, and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at them in defiance, but the Lord just laughs, for he sees their day of judgment coming. The wicked draw their swords and string their bows to kill the poor and the oppressed, to slaughter those who do right, but their swords will stab their own hearts, and their bows will be broken. It is better to be godly and to have little than to be evil and rich, for the strength of the wicked will be shattered, but the Lord takes care of the godly. Day after day, the Lord takes care of the innocent, and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Even in famine, they will have more than enough. But the wicked will die. The Lord's enemies are like flowers in a field. They will disappear like smoke. The wicked borrow and never repay. But the godly are generous givers. Those the Lord blesses will possess the land, but those he curses will die. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Once I was young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. Yesterday, in Luke 23, Jesus was tried by Pilato and Herode, before finally Pilato caved into pressure and sentenced Jesus to death. We repeat a few verses, starting at verse 36. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, and the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? 
Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said about the ones crucifying him, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched, and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers mocked him, too, by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us, too, while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. By this time it was about noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light of the sun was gone and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with these words he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshipped God and said, Surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. He was a member of the Jewish high council, but he had not agreed with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was one of those waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilato and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of the rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun, so they rested as required by the law. Today for our prayer together, I read Stuart Townen's hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Let's worship God together using these words. How deep the Father's love for us! How vast beyond all measure! That He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure! How great the pain of searing loss! The Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the Chosen One. Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, My sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers. 
It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom.